Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. I hope you are all having a beautiful Saturday. Uh, I'm just so honored that you chose to spend some time uh, with me on this wonderful Saturday. So far today, I've been to the farmer's market, which is one of my most favorite things ever. I go all the time, even though I have like my own garden full of veggies. I just like to go see people and just kind of just soak up all those farmer market vibes. So did that and I had a friend come over and tend to our beehive. So it's been a beautiful Saturday and I hope you are having a wonderful Saturday as well. Um, whether, well, if you're joining us live here, I would love to hear from you in the chat box. Um, I definitely want your questions. So a big part of this you know, live class is about answering your questions for cooling inflammation questions about chronic inflammation. I'm definitely here for that. Also, as you know, going to do a short class on rose hips, which I'm super excited for. Uh, in the meantime, though, I would love to hear from you. How's your Saturday going? Where are you, where are you calling in from? Um, probably don't say calling in anymore, but <laughs> where are you typing in from? I don't know. Where are you joining us from? How about that? I'd love to hear from you all out there. And I will give just a little bit of time for folks to join us uh, before I jump into the rose hips. But if you know me, then you know I don't like you know, wasting your time or mine. So we will get to that pretty quickly. I uh, just want to give time for folks to get in the door so that no one misses anything. All right. And I am seeing folks starting to chime in there. We have Jennifer from Scotland first person. Yay. I was just talking about my deep love of Scotland today. And I'm reading these books right now. Um, the Forgotten Queen series by Signe Pike. Such good books. Um, also take place in Scotland. Um, oh, lots. We have lots of UK folks here. I see um, Cornwall, which is where Tori Amos lives. So yay. Uh, Serbia. Devon, UK, New Zealand, and uh, not to be discriminatory, we've got lots of folks from the US as well, Texas, California. Hi, Pat. Pat's calling in from Winthrop, Washington, which is just about 20 minutes from me. Um, Denise from Dublin. Um, spent some time in Dublin just this year. I definitely love it over there. All right. Thanks. It's, it's, it's so interesting always to me. I mean, I know we've all done this, typed where we're from, but it is always interesting just to see where everyone's calling in from, to see um, folks who are here. And again, just really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Um, I, I have a short presentation, but I've been working on it all week. I'm super excited to um, discuss uh, rose hips. I feel like they are super underrated for chronic inflammation, especially. And where I live, they're everywhere right now. So they're definitely on the top of my mind. Um, and I see some questions about rose hips coming in. So good. I will definitely be, uh, I'm going to do my presentation first because I think it's going to answer a lot of your questions about rose hips and then we will be, you know, I'll be able to answer particular questions as well because that's why I'm here live is definitely to answer your questions. I know a lot of you watched the webinar uh, last week on how to heal chronic inflammation with herbs. I've been getting tons of emails about that. Uh, so if you're able to watch that, awesome. If you have questions about the webinar, or about cooling inflammation, I'm definitely here for that, especially uh, because you aren't able to answer questions on the, that webinar format. So I just definitely want to leave no questions unanswered. And um, if anybody has any questions about cooling inflammation or about the webinar, I can answer one or two of those before I jump into the rose hips. Um, I'm definitely seeing lots of questions about rose hips. I'm excited. Yay, rose hips. Yeah, I feel like rose hips should be just as popular as turmeric, um, but obviously they aren't yet. So um, we, we will change that today. And yeah, still lots of questions about rose hips. I do want to just look at um, and, you know, answer, I'll answer the rose hip questions after the presentation since I'll use it. Um, all right, this is, for those of you who don't know, super Tori Amos fan here. And we hear from Angel that didn't know Tori Amos live here. She's not too far from me, which basically means I'm coming to visit you. And we can just walk through, you know, walk the trails and look for Tori. Just kidding. <laughs> um, Andrew 
or Angie, I guess it is. Um, is it possible to get the webinar? I did sign up for it, but did not receive it. Yeah, sorry about that. Sometimes there's just weird technical stuff. There, you know, thousands of people did view it, but I don't know, there's just things that fall through the slack, uh, fall through the cracks. Also, there's some people had trouble with buffering. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that all together today and put it out in a different format um, for you tomorrow. So um, that is coming. Amber is wondering how many herbs will be covered in cooling inflammation. And we go over about 50 total in the class. And we do that in kind of various ways. Um, some of them we form really deep relationships with and we spend a lot of time. And some of them are um, you know, not as deep, but there are over 50 monographs in the course. And one thing that I think is really important about the cooling inflammation course is that we don't Whenever we're talking about the herbs and we're talking how to get results, like with specifically chronic inflammation, then we really need to talk about what is the dosage? How do we take this plant? Because if I just said like rose hips are good for arthritis, they are, right? They totally are. But if I just said that, you wouldn't, you'd like, you'd have this fact, rose hips are good for arthritis, but you wouldn't know, well, how much do I need to take? How long do I need to take it? What form do I take it in, et cetera. And that is the difference between like getting results and not getting results. And the cooling inflammation class is really about getting results because it's a very specific talk bit, right? One that is always near and dear to my heart because I'm sure all of us here either, we either have dealt with chronic inflammation or we know someone we love and care for who's dealing with chronic inflammation. And that's because right now we live in this world where um, inflammation is just pervasive, right? Uh, chronic inflammation, inflammation especially. And that's because, as I was sharing in the webinar, it's like the reasons for chronic inflammation are so high right now. You know, we have all of these things contributing to that as a problem. And at the same time, so that's really high. And then at the same time, our methods of controlling systemic and chronic inflammation are way down. So it's this complete imbalance. And there's no way to just get rid of inflammation. We actually need inflammation in our body. It helps heal acute injuries. But even with chronic inflammation, or not, I shouldn't say chronic inflammation, but having inflammation show up is a good thing because it's like it teaches your body to be resilient. And they've done studies showing that, unfortunately, animal studies, which I definitely hate to talk about, but just, you know, they have done things where they turned off inflammatory processes completely. And then uh, these animals live shorter lives. And the way that they think about that is it's like if you're building muscles or just think about your muscles, like if you, we know if you laid in a bed 24 seven, your muscles would atrophy, right? You need kind of stress on your muscles you, in order to build your muscles and maintain muscular strength. And so inflammation is similar. If you have zero amount of a little flammy, if you have no inflammation coming in, then your body doesn't learn how to deal with it. So we aren't trying, when we think about in today's modern world where there's so much inflammation and then we're doing very little to what we call quench that inflammation, it's just very uneven. And that's what leads to this chronic inflammation that's causing all of these problems from type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer, so many aches and pains, foggy thinking. I mean, it really is just so much of the problems we're dealing with today are is that imbalance of things. And so cooling inflammation is figuring out how do we create this dynamic balance that's more like this, you know, this is kind of how we want inflammation to be is this, like the seesaw that's just like doesn't like isn't moving a whole bunch versus like this. Um, so I think that um, with, with that little tangent, we should jump into the rose hips. Um, I know you're all excited for this and I'm seeing some questions about it as well. So I have slides. Uh, I love visuals. Oh, and let me get rid of this coolinginflammation.com for now. There we go. All right. Okay. So can you all see that slide pretty, that well? It says myths and truths about rose hips. Is that coming through okay? I have to wait a second because there's a little bit of a time lag, but just want to make sure that it's looking good there. All right. So Karen who is our student services coordinator is in the background and she says it looks great. And Michelle is also here. She's our tech wizard at Herbs with Rosalie. Yes, 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 great. 
All right. So thanks, Karen and Michelle, for being here. And again, thank you all for being here. All right. Let's talk about rose hips. So I'm super excited about rose hips, as I said, because right now I go on a walk every single day and I've been watching them, you know, become riper and riper, riper. And now they're kind of at their peak right now. And I walk around and just see the abundance of rose hips everywhere. And again, I just think, man, so underrated for inflammation as well as all of their other gifts. But of course, right now, inflammation being a big topic with uh, cooling inflammation class enrolling. And I just think they're underrated because they are prolific, they're abundant, they grow around so many of us. And if they don't grow near you, you can buy them generally pretty readily and uh, you know fairly inexpensively too. So lots of great things about rose hips here. And I just, you know, if you ask like people on the street who kind of know about herbs, I guess they have to know a little bit about herbs. I guess if you walked into a health food store and you said, you know, what herb is great for inflammation? Everyone's gonna say turmeric, right? And I'm not going to de deny that turmeric isn't great. Turmeric is amazing, but it has some drawbacks. And um, and there's so many other plants out there. Another big part of cooling inflammation is that uh, we have to think about that diversity is such a big thing. Like you can't just, like you cannot quell chronic inflammation with one plant, right? That's just not, that's not how it works. So the more plants we learn, the better. So let's talk about rose hips. And let's start at the beginning. What are rose hips? Well, they are, uh, they come from the rose plant. It's a picture of a wild rose. And they are, they begin as this inferior ovary. So it's reproductive parts of the rose plant. And so if you see a rose with a little um, bud there, flower bud, then that little green pea-sized bump at the end there, that is what will eventually develop into a rose hip. And in the bottom corner there, you can see a cross section of it and you can see seeds are starting to form in that rose hip. So it's been pollinated. So that's what a rose hip is. And rose hips, after they've been pollinated, after the rose petals have fallen away, they will begin to get riper and riper. You know, they start off really small and then they'll get bigger and bigger. They'll be green for a while. Then they might, depending on the species, they might turn orange and then eventually they will be red once they get more, more ripe. All right, so I wanna talk about some myths about rose hips because I feel like I see these everywhere all the time, people saying these things about rose hips that just aren't quite, they're like half true or not, not, not even true. The first one is that people will get pretty upset if you use heat uh, to make any kind of rose hip preparation. Um, because it destroys the vitamin C content. And maybe I should back up a little bit just to say, if you didn't know, rose hips are super high in vitamin C. That is true. When you bite into a rose hip, like a fresh rose hip, you'll taste it. You know, it'll taste sour, like you expect, uh, uh, you know, something high in vitamin C to taste, like sour like a lemon or sour like an orange, for example. And so... It, it's also true that vitamin C is sensitive to heat. And it's also, it, vitamin C is kind of like this very delicate vitamin and it breaks down so easily. It actually breaks down as soon as you pick the plant, whether that is broccoli or kiwi or orange. Anytime you pick these plants that are generally high in vitamin C, as soon as you pick them, that vitamin C content is greatly reduced. I remember reading a study showing that broccoli, once you harvest broccoli, 20, just 24 hours after you harvest broccoli, 50% of its vitamin C is just gone. So it's just a very delicate thing. So when you're thinking like, oh, I really want to get the most vitamin C possible, whether it's rose hips or any other fruit or vegetable, fresher, the better which is why it's great to harv go to your local farmer's market, grow your own, et cetera. If you are lucky enough to have rose hips growing near you, they become a little trail side nibble, just have them straight off the bush. Because again, once you harvest them, once you cook them, once you dry them, their vitamin C is gonna be diminished. It's not gonna be zero though. I think that's important to notice. You know, during World War II, uh, people in the UK famously harvested lots of rose hips, which they then had were mass manufactured into syrups, which is a process that involves heat. 
and then just this unimaginable amount of gallons and gallons and gallons of syrup, rose hip syrup was sent, especially to France, but sent all over. And that's because during World War II, all of the citrus fruits that normally came up from further down south, that those, you know, those weren't making it through anymore and people were having a tough time not getting enough vitamin C. So um, a lot of women's organizations in the UK kind of rallied around this. And in I've done the research on this in newspapers back from the 1940s in the UK, they would actually like different chapters would like brag how many rose hips they were able to harvest. So anyway, cool history on that. I mean, cool, sad, um, but just showing that this, you know, was made into syrup, which was high in vitamin C, which was often given to like orphanages and people struggling to get their vitamin C. So fresher, the better when it comes to vitamin C. But here's the thing about rose hips. I think sometimes people think that rose hips equal vitamin C because that's often told, like they are amazingly high in vitamin C. They have more vitamin C per weight than say an orange, right? So they definitely have a ton of vitamin C, but rose hips are not vitamin C, right? There's so many wonderful benefits to rose hips. And rose hips, even when they're dried, are super amazing for inflammation. So here's some studies showing, for example, that there's 129 chemical compounds that's been isolated and identified in rose hips. And they have major active components like flavonoids, amazing for inflammation, tannins, anthocyanins, again, amazing for inflammation, phenolic compounds, fatty oils, organic acids, and inorganic compounds. Um, besides the phytochemicals, they are also really high in, as mentioned, vitamin C, Calcium, magnesium, potassium, beta carotene, quercetin, tocopherols, and lycopene. So we can't just, and these are just like words that we've come up with to explain these different phytochemicals and minerals and stuff, but there's truly so much in a rose hip that goes far beyond what we can even identify and name, but definitely goes well beyond vitamin C. All right, so this is where I'm going to show you that we know that uh, rose hips are amazing for inflammation, especially osteo osteoarthritis. This uh, was a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, which that's like the pinnacle of scientific research. It's like, it's not just saying here's one study. It's saying we looked at all the studies uh, and we looked at high quality studies and we, we conclude that rose hip powder reduces pain in osteoarthritis patients. So that's pretty awesome. Another um, just independent studies have shown that regularly eating rose hips can decrease the pain and inflammation associated with both osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, two very different kinds of arthritis, but both of them seeing positive effects with rose hips. This is an interesting um, paper that was looking at the evidence behind rose hips. And they concluded because of rose hips, analgesic, anti-arthritic, anti-inflammatory, antioxidative and bone preserving activities, the Rosa genus is a treasure waiting for further exploration by researchers interested in the development of safe and effective anti-arthritic agents. So this is like not my business, right? Like I'm not in the business of like isolating chemicals or, um, you know, and then putting in a pill and patenting those, you know, that's not what I'm here for. But, you know, this is kind of like, they're saying this is a treasure waiting for further exploration. But as people who love herbs, we can just be like, yeah, we know rose hips are amazing. And we are excited just to start using them. We don't have to wait for a patent, right? They're growing right outside of our uh, doors. Uh, other benefits that we see with rose hips is that when taken daily in large amounts, rose hip powder has been shown to improve blood pressure and plasma cholesterol, thus reducing cardiovascular risk factors. So cardiovascular disease in large part is due specifically to chronic inflammation. So that is kind of, we can, you know, if you go see a doctor, they might give you different medications for different things. Um, you know, you get anti-cholesterol medication like statins, or you'll get, 
you know, something to lower blood pressure or whatever may be the situation, but truly the root of most cardiovascular disease is chronic inflammation. And until you figure out, you know, what's going on for you with chronic inflammation, it's just Band-Aid solutions. Sometimes those Band-Aid solutions are necessary. I'm not telling anybody to go off their meds. I'm just saying that you want to get it at the root cause, right? Which is chronic inflammation. So here's some evidence showing that rosehip powder in large amounts daily uh, can help with that. And all of that information right there is very important. And again, what we look at a lot in cooling inflammation is not just simply rose hips are good for cardiovascular disease, right? Because that's just not helpful. What we need to know is how much, how often, what form, et cetera. All right. So the first myth, you should never heat or boil rose hips because it destroys the vitamin C content, um, which is, you know, partially true. But if you only want vitamin C for rose hips, then just eat them straight off the bush and revel in them. Um, but they are filled with benefits beyond vitamin C. I will stress that getting the right dose is important because as much as I would like to say, like having a little nibble will, um, you know, will do it for you. That's probably not going to happen. We need therapeutic dosages. And I wanted to share this, you know, just thinking about dosage. Uh, Della wrote this. She was a student last year in cooling inflammation. And I asked uh, the students last year, you know, what was what was the most surprising thing that you learned from the cooling inflammation workshop? And I got some really interesting answers, uh, but this is what Della said. I So what was surprising to her was how much damage inflammation can do and that it can be reversed and managed. Okay. Um, I was surprised by the feedback that we can take therapeutic dosage of herbs for a prolonged period. I've been warned by some herbalists and labels not to take for more than a couple of months. And I was also surprised to learn about titration and finding the right dosage for us. For us. And yeah, that was probably one of the most common things I heard about surprising is just how we find the right dosage for plants for us. And it's, it's just a little bit complicated in herbalism because when we talk about whole bulk herbs, we, you know, we're not talking about a prescription that comes in a bottle that says, you know, that Sam should take this many pills this many times a day, right? That's not how herbalism works. More than that, there's so much variation because the reason why prescriptions can do that is because it is a standardized thing, right? They know exactly how much of XYZ is in that pill. With herbs, they aren't standardized, so they can have different amounts of whatever, you know, good stuff is in there. So basically what I'm saying is like your rose hips aren't necessarily my rose hips. So we have to take that, the variation between plants into perspective. And then the other thing is that we have to find dosages that work for us as individuals. So how much I might take is going to be different than how much you might take. So there's just no straight cut and clear way for that, but we have to figure out a way to figure out dosage because that is one of the most important things about getting good, great results with herbs. And that's what we spend um, a good amount of time doing in the cooling inflammation class. All right, another myth I see a lot about is rose hips and how you should only harvest them after a frost. And it is true that when you harvest rose hips after they frost, so after the temperature goes um, below freezing overnight, they are a little bit sweeter. And so it's not necessarily not true to do that, but it's overly simplified because of a couple of reasons. One, not everybody gets frosts, right? So, and that can mean a different, a couple of different things. Like I was just chatting with Karen, our student services coordinator before class started today. And uh, she lives in San Diego. Not a lot of frosts happening in San Diego. So if she waited for a frost to happen, then there would not be a lot of rose hips for Karen. Another thing is that sometimes people do get frosts in their area, but it's so far past the season of prime rose hips that they've just like, they're already mush and just have like basically wasted away. Uh, they're just no longer in their prime, I guess we should say on the bush. So it really is a climate thing and like where that fits. If your rose hips just like come to prime perfection, and then there's a frost, that would be a great time to harvest them. You don't want to wait for a whole bunch of frost though, because studies have shown that 
if uh, when you know more and the more and more frost that happened to the rose plant, the more those basically beneficial constituents start to degrade within the rose hips. So you're looking for a sweet spot. And I would also want to point out that rose hips are you know, a part of this earth. They're ever changing. They aren't static. So it's not like they, they're just this one thing. And what studies have shown is that rose hips change um, their constituents and all the good stuff in them over time. So in this image that you see here, there's a lot of like light colored orangey rose hips. Well, they've shown that when they're in that stage, a lot of rose hips that are the orange color actually have more like beta carotene in them. And so my advice is to try rose hips all the time and to get them from a variety of places. I don't know that there's a lot of benefit in like completely unripe rose hips that are green, but we can definitely, you know, be trying them at different times, tasting them, seeing what they're like um, when they're around you. So there can be this kind of like great time to harvest them if all, if all the things come together and it works out great. You know, like they come to their prime and then there's a frost. If you live in a climate like that, great. Um, but otherwise, I would just, I would be harvesting them, tasting them as often as you can. I guess I already said this. <laughs> Rose hips can be sweeter after a frost. Um, too many frosts is not a good thing but rose hips have an ever changing array of nutrients throughout their life cycle. So you wanna just keep harvesting them. All right, another one that's kind of confusing about rose hips is what to do with those seeds um, and how do you work with them having these seeds? So here we have um, some, you see some rose hips there and then there's some that have been de-seeded. So depending on the variety of rows that you have, you know, there's this like fleshy outer covering and then inside there's a bunch of seeds. And along with the seeds, there's a bunch of kind of irritating hairs. And so those irritating hairs aren't the best. And when you eat too many of those, there, there's a couple of herb books out there that report that you will get an itchy bottom because they are irritating throughout your digestive tract and irritating when they come back out again. So it's not recommended to eat a lot of those itchy hairs um, and seeds, but I have seen people like just eat them and have no problem. So I think it's like a, probably a tolerability and how much. Here's what I say about the seed issue. If you are going to eat the rose hips, like eat the whole, all the flesh and everything, whether you're eating them fresh or you're going to dry them for later, or one of my favorite things is to de-seed fresh rose hips and infuse them into honey. That is an amazing treat. If you're gonna do that, then it's definitely worth it to de-seed the rose hips. And how I like to do this is um, I put them actually in the freezer first and get them hard and then bring them out of the freezer and take a butter knife, slice them in half, and then use the top of the knife to just scoop out the seeds. The how you de-seed rose hips, I mean, this definitely can be kind of a trying thing. You know, it takes some time and some effort. The best way to do it kind of depends on what rose hips you have. There's just different techniques for whether rose has super hard flesh or just a lot of flesh or not a lot of flesh. So you just kind of have to play around with it. But I do think that the, um, the frozen tip is a good one. However, so it does take a lot of time and effort to de-seed the roses. This is not necessary if you're going to strain whatever you're making so that you don't consume those hairs and the seeds. So what I mean by that is if you're going to dry the rose hips or you buy them, you buy them already dried and they're whole. If you're going to make tea out of them, if you're going to make a syrup out of them. And then with both those methods, you're going to strain off the actual rose hips, compost those, and then drink the liquid where there's no seeds. Then there's no point in going through the hassle of trying to get rid of those seeds because it does take a long time. All right, myth number four, humans are the only ones who love rose hips. All right, I know people don't often say this, but it seems like a good amount, a good time to remember that we are not the only creatures and beings on this earth who love rose hips. So many do. They're a really important source of food for so many animals out there. I live in the forest myself, so these are 
um, things that I often see around and I actually see them eating. I'm, it's not uncommon for me to see deer eating the rose hips. So whenever I am harvesting rose hips, I just keep that in mind. Uh, there's so many where I live and that it's not a big issue, but I still, even though there's a lot where I live, I never go to a bush and just take all of the rose hips that I see there. I harvest some, go to another bush, harvest some, et cetera. So just being respectful that I'm not the only person who's loving these rose hips. All right, I think I saw a question about the rose hips. You know, a rose hip is a rose hip is a rose hip or all rose hips are the same. And they are definitely not. This is from Wikipedia, just showing all of the different species. And this is not even all of the different species. This is some of the different species of roses out there. So all these different species. And that translates into a lot of different looking hips, right? There's just, there's so many different ones out there. Ragosa roses are kind of some of my favorite for the hips because those hips will get like almost plum size and they're super fleshy and yummy. Um, my native roses around here are kind of more like that far image on the right there with the blue background. They, uh, they tend to be a little bit smaller, but sometimes those, the smaller, more leathery ones are a little bit more higher in nutrients. So that's something um, to think about as well. And what I recommend is that you taste as many rose hips as you can. And you taste them at different times in their cycles of where they're at with, um, you know, where, how, where they're at in their cycle of maturity. And some, you'll find that sometimes they're sweet. You'll find sometimes they're tart and sour. Oftentimes they are, but some of them are kind of bland. Some of them might have some like bitter properties to them. It really depends on the rose hip. And it's not just a genus or, or not just a species specific thing. Sometimes just altitude and like where that bush is, how much sun it gets, how high or low it is in altitude can all change the flavor. So it's a great idea to eat your rose hips whenever you see them, positively ID them, of course, make sure it hasn't been sprayed by, you know, anything and try out these different rose hips and you'll find like your favorite bushes. Maybe your favorite bushes will change over time because things change in the environment, but it's a good idea to test your rose hips and see how they are. And that, and the way that they taste will give you an impression of what's in there. So for example, if they're super tart and sour, they're probably pretty high in vitamin C because that's, we know that vitamin C has that sour taste to it. If it's sweet, um, then it might have this kind of moistening quality to it. If it's bitter, then might we know that it has some, you know, maybe some digestive properties in it. So uh, you want to taste them. Uh, I'm seeing a great comment here. Um, I have over a dozen different varieties of roses. Only one has sweet rose hips. Yeah. So that's another thing. Um, I often think about wild roses just because where I live, I'm in a forest where there's lots of wild roses, but with hybrid roses, they're, um, you know, they have different properties. They've been bred for things like the amount of petals and the color of the petals. They aren't always bred for their rose hips, obviously. And so you can use the rose hips of these hybridized, um, roses but again your taste is going to be a great way like if you taste them and they just have no taste whatsoever um maybe they're super bitter i don't know those are going to not be the same have the same qualities perhaps as wild ones so give them a give them a taste see how they go all right here's my last slide for you I just want to encourage you to enjoy rose hips. There's so many wonderful ways to enjoy them out there. Um, just simply eating them fresh. I love rose hip chia seed pudding. Uh, just last winter, I made nettle crackers, like thumbprint crackers with um, a kind of a rose hip um, mash in the middle. So good. Uh, making a tea. I actually prefer a decoction versus a tea, but making you know a water-based, making a syrup, Using the powder can be used in all sorts of fabulous things like cakes. Uh, so lots of ways to enjoy uh, making rose hip medicine. All right, I'm back with you. 
that's what I have for rose hips. I hope that answered a lot of the questions I saw um, earlier. And if you still have questions about rose hips, I'm happy to answer them. Also happy to answer any questions you have about the How to Heal Chronic Inflammation webinar and uh, questions about cooling inflammation, which is uh, my live course that's starting next week. And it's all about how to address chronic inflammation in your life using wonderful plants like rose hips. I do have another um, little mini, mini class for you about um, using herbs for inflammation, but I'm going to check in with you all first because I've just, I've done a lot of talking and now it'd be great to hear uh, from you. Okay. Anna says, do all rose hips have therapeutic properties? I want to say yes, many of them do, but I would say probably more of the either wild varieties or ones that are what we call apothecary roses, which have been, haven't been hybridized. I think, you know, some, like I was saying, some roses that are these commercial varieties that have been largely hybridized, they, you know, they might've had things you know, inadvertently hybridized out of them, just kind of like how it is at the grocery store today, you know, like tomatoes originally are, were like this big and they were pretty bitter, but super high in nutrients, right? Tons of lycopene, lots of wonderful phytonutrients in there. But, you know, humans love these little tomatoes and over time they've been hybridized and selected out um, for all these different qualities. And so when you find like sun gold to tomatoes, which are like the little orange ones, which are absolutely yummy, those have very little phytonutrients compared to their ancestors. Or you see like really big ones, like the big yellow ones, uh, those often have a lot less phytonutrients in them as well. So it's kind of the same with rose hips. Um, if they've been hybridized out of the wild, then they've probably lost some of their therapeutic value. Again, tasting them is gonna be helpful. Um, Brenda said, did my black rose hip just dry on the bush? So black rose hips can be a couple of issues. I've definitely seen that one. It could be last year's rose hips that have just, you know, lasted. I like my rose hips have, well, see, la oh, that's last year's. It's black and dried out. Another thing that can happen, especially in the garden, is if they're watered, um, especially overhead a lot, they, they might just kind of um, mold on the bush. And also, again, the hybridization can play a role too, that they just, they aren't really bred to survive very long. Um, Jocelyn, do rose hips have more drying or moistening? They, that's a great question. Should have put that in the presentation, but I'm glad you asked, Jocelyn. Uh, they have much more of a moistening quality to them, which I think is especially important when we talk about things for inflammation because again, turmeric gets all the glory for inflammation, but inflammation is um, sometimes just due to dryness and turmeric is very drying. So it's good to have other herbs that we can lean into like rose hips so that um, we aren't just dealing with drying herbs, but we can also address dryness and help with inflammation in that way. I'm just looking through the questions here. Terry's wondering if you can make an infusion with rose hips. Technically you can, but something that I would invite all of you rose hip lovers to do is to make a simple tea out of rose hips. So boil some water, steep it in the rose hips and taste that, and then make a decoction. So that's simmering the rose hips and simmer the rose hips and simmer and then strain that off and do a taste comparison between the two of them. And I think you'll find that those taste very different in terms of strength. Um, guitar beginner, when is your class on inflammation? Class is enrolling right now. And will our first live class takes place on Thursday. So enrollment is open until Wednesday. Um, Leroy's wondering if dogs can eat rose hips. I'm pretty sure they can. I'm not very much of an animal expert when it comes to herb, but I'm pretty sure they can. I know, you know, so many animals love rose hips, so I don't see why not. 
Amber's wondering how long is each individual class each Thursday? So this is referring to cooling inflammation, which, so how the class is set up, the workshop set up is for two months, we meet every Thursday night for a live class. I do about 45 to 60 minutes of class time. And then I stay on for like another hour or so and make sure everyone's questions are answered about that class. Some people love to show up live. Some people love to watch the recording. So both are available either live or recording. And some people don't want to stick around for Q&A, so they don't. Some people just stick around for the first hour. So it's a great thing about adult education. We get to decide. Um, Amber, would rose hips be good to add to nettle infusions for the moistening qualities? Good question. So nettles also um, a plant that we go into in depth and in cooling inflammation uh, like turmeric, but nettles can also be a bit drying like turmeric. So the rose hips could be something that's added and that longer infusion time that you do typically do with nettles can be helpful with that as well. Um, my Cornwall friend here. Uh, how long can you keep them whole in the freezer before they lose their benefits? Um, so the, there's actually been studies on this. And from what I remember is, you know, after about six months, it's not like they've, you know, lost their value, but things start to deteriorate. So when you're harvesting rose hips, you definitely want to think about like how much you're going to have in a year. It's not really beneficial to keep things around for, you know, years, for example. Oh, here's a great question, Jocelyn. Um, you are doing great with the great questions. Any lookalikes that we should be aware of that are not edible? Um, so, you know, if you're a beginner forager, anything can be a lookalike. So things that might not look alike to me um, with a couple decades of experience behind me might look alike to somebody else. So that's something that's important to keep in mind. And a lot of red fruits in particular are poisonous. So you definitely want to be certain that you are you know, you know positively what you're harvesting and you're not just eating red berries out there. Rose hips are very different in that they're not a berry, but still it could be confusing. So um, off the top of my head, I'm just not thinking of something that looks like, but that is definitely a possibility if, if someone doesn't know a lot about botanical ID. Um, Brenda says, if you can't grow them well, like in Southern Florida, where's a good place to buy? So one of my favorite ways to buy rose hips, and I do this quite a bit, is I buy de-seeded rose hips from Mountain Rose Herbs. And um, Mountain Rose Herbs is a great company. They offer a lot of organic bulk herbs. So often that's kind of the most cost-effective way to buy it. And I work a lot with Mountain Rose Herbs and they are offering my students a discount. So if you're in cooling inflammation, you'll be able to get a discount on, when you buy herbs from them. That's Mountain Rose Herbs. They're in Oregon and they have wonderful de-seeded dried rose hips, which are just really nice to use. Um, Ronam, another question. I um, Will the inflammation class be recorded? I'm unable to make it on Thursday. And yes, Thursday we have the live classes, but they're immediately viewable um, as a recording. And there's also transcripts available too. So some people like to attend live, but some people actually prefer to watch the recording, have the transcript, et cetera. Um, just going through the questions here. I also know Karen's helping me with questions, so I should um, check out. Um, guitar beginner, sorry, I don't know your name, but. Can you cold infuse rose hips? I generally cold, cold infuse nettles tea overnight. Yeah, so when you cold infuse things, you're getting different properties out of them. The, For example, when you cold infuse nettles, you're not really going to get a lot of vitamins and minerals from the nettles that way, um, but you can get other properties from them. I love to cold infuse uh, fresh herbs that are aromatic because it, it pulls out those aromatics in a way that's really wonderful. Uh, so you could cold infuse the rose hips, you'll probably get some moistening qualities out of it. I encourage you to try both. Try a cold infusion, try a hot infusion, taste the difference, and then try a decoction too. Um, let's see. Chris is wondering what time is a live class on Thursdays? It's at 4 p.m. Pacific time. 
Um, but again, they're available as recordings too. And there's eight weeks in the cooling inflammation class. And each week we look at a different topic. And then I give you homework, which is I call invitations. And you get to choose one invitation that you do that week. And so that you're trying this new thing each week. They're often simple. You know, they're not over the top difficult. I know we all have limited time. So you come to the class, you choose an invitation for that week. And in so doing, you're figuring out what's going to work for you in chronic inflammation. And so by the end of two months that we spend together, eight weeks, you've tried up to eight different things, possibly more. Uh, and you're seeing how those things change. And this class is truly transformative. I created it specifically in this way because I wanted to see people actually get results. So that using herbs for chronic inflammation isn't just theoretical and it doesn't just like be like, oh, that would be a good idea, but it's actually something that makes a difference in their lives uh, because chronic inflammation is such a serious thing that's affecting so many of us and herbs and other lifestyle things, we don't just talk about herbs, are absolutely essential for changing this in our society today, but we don't, we don't often have the roadmap to do so. So that's what cooling inflammation is about. Um, yes, we, this recording, I will do my best to get that available to you tomorrow. Uh, another rose hip. Um, Jillian says, I, uh, I buy dried rose hip powder. Is this good to add to foods or should it be made into a tea? Can I add it to honey to make an oxymel? So great question. I love rose hip powder and I love to cook with it. So I love to put it into breads, into cakes. Uh, it just, it works really well that way because it actually adds a density to those things I find really pleasant, adds the flavor, and it's a great way to get a lot of the, the herb uh, into you. The thing about the powder is anytime we powder something, it's going to lose, you know, it'll lose its nutrients faster. So when you buy powdered rose hips, you just want to use it up very quickly, but absolutely. You could make it into a tea, but you know, it might depending on how you feel about bits and pieces in your tea, it might feel a little, um, you know, it might be a little chalky or something, but you certainly could. Um, hi, Jessica, <laughs> guitar beginner. Um, so I didn't talk about those seeds very much. Rochelle says, are the rose hip seeds beneficial? Do they need to be removed before eating or drinking the rose hip? So I did mention that, that they do need to be removed, um, mainly because of those irritating hairs. And the, the seeds are beneficial in that one process that's done, this is like a mass, you know, manufacturing process, is the seeds are expeller pressed. So they, you know, press the seeds, get the oil from the seeds, and that becomes rose hip seed oil, which is absolutely lovely and often used in um, cosmetics. So that's the thing, but uh, they aren't generally eaten a lot. Um, it is good to see you here, um, Shalyn. And uh, I know you write me often. I don't quite know how to pronounce your name, but I hope that's close. And I'm also sorry for your loss. I'm also dealing with a loss myself. So I know how hard that can be. Um, and I think you'd mentioned, yeah, this will be available. And as far as cooling inflammation goes, I will most likely offer it again next year. I think this will be the last time that I offer it live. I offered it live for the first time last year, which means just having the live courses. And I almost didn't do it again live this year, but we had so much fun last year with the live and it was fun, you know, interacting um, back and forth. But I think this might be the last time I offer it live. So that would be a, you know, a reason to do it this year versus next year. But I, I'm cooling inflammation is not going away. I would love for it to go away. If we didn't have chronic inflammation anymore, I would definitely not offer this class, but while, while we're dealing with that, I want to see people get help with it. Um, and if you're wondering about more details for cooling inflammation, you can go to coolinginflammation.com and there has all the details about the course and you can register there as well. Um, wondering about growing your own roses. I've actually never seen rose seeds for sale. 
it, so obviously roses do get, um, you know, spread by seed, mainly by birds and other animals who eat those rose hips and then digest the seeds. I think they might need to go through the digestive tract before they're viable. I'm not quite sure. They are pretty hard to start from seed. And so um, I think it might be more possible with wild roses to do that, but mostly hybridized roses are, um, you buy them as like bare root stock or something like that. So they're often, you know, some, there's a lot goes into the creation of um, rose hips, something that I don't know a lot about, but obviously seeds, seeds must make plants somehow. Um, Lori's wondering, is cooling inflammation a Zoom cast? Will we be on camera? So the format is exactly like this, where there's a chat and then there's me. There's not, um, a, so you aren't on camera, but you are able to put questions in the chat. And because I'm so dedicated to answering your questions, I mean, that's a huge part of this live course is that you, if you don't show, if you're not able to show up live, you can ask your questions, um, send in your questions ahead of time. Uh, Karen, student services coordinator, coordinator who's in the background is so awesome. She collects those questions. And I answer them. We also have a forum where you can ask your questions there too. So um, that's how that works. Um, all right, Rana says, I have three volunteer rose bushes. The rest were planted by my husband and me. So that's wonderful. Um, let's see. Shalen, so this is not the last time I'm going to offer cooling inflammation. It's the last time, most likely, that I'm going to offer it live. So in the future, it'll be, you know, pre-recorded and you'll go through it on your own. Right now it's set up to be a live workshop. So we're going through it together and I'm there answering your questions, et cetera. And in the future, it'll probably be more of a pre-recorded thing. Hmm. Um, Amber's wondering how much is Facebook a part of the class? I'm not on Facebook. I hear you. Facebook is not my favorite either. Um, the Facebook portion of the class is just a bonus for folks who want to be a part of that. Um, Sometimes, you know, People don't have to be a part of the Facebook group. It's I'm not there. I'm not posting new information there. Um, I jump in a couple times maybe to answer a question or two. But for the most part, it's a place for students to have community and to encourage each other, inspire each other, that sort of thing. What I do recommend for folks is that if you want to, if you're really like, yes, I want the community aspect of it, but I don't like Facebook, I actually give you a setup of like how to create a fake account how to just join the group and then how to bookmark the group. So you can just go straight to the group community, Facebook. You don't see ads. You don't see a news feed. You don't otherwise participate in it. And then when you're done, you just delete your account. So um, it's free, it's easy, and you don't have to participate in Facebook or ads or anything if you don't want to. But again, some people just don't want to do that. So that's fine too. It's There's no information shared on Facebook that isn't shared in the classes and that sort of thing as well. All right, see, there's lots going on. Information, thanks, Rachel. Cold stratified the seeds for four months. So yeah, they need some They need some time and some help. Um, let's see, I know, let me check in with Karen and see what questions that I might have missed. Sometimes as you see, they go by pretty fast and I miss them, but I definitely want to get uh, your questions. Karen says, scroll up higher. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm just looking through questions. And if you, if you asked a question, I didn't get to it and you're like, I would really like it if Rosalie answered my question. Just type it in there again. That helps me know like you're still here and it helps me find those questions that, um, you know, you're looking for. Um, all right. Lori asked, could you or would you make a tincture from rose hips? That's a great question. You definitely can make a tincture from rose hips. And there's kind of pluses and minuses to that type of preparation. So a tincture is an alcohol extract of the rose hip and it's going to pull out certain properties of it um, and not others. So it doesn't pull out things like vitamins and minerals because that's just not what alcohol does. Uh, but it certainly can be pulling out other phytochemicals. 
one thing I like to do is fill a jar with ripe rose hips and then put a lot of honey in there and then fill it the rest of the way with brandy, which is what we call an elixir. And then you strain that off after four or six weeks and you'll have this beautiful ruby red elixir that you can take in small amounts. Um, that, I mean, I, when I say small amounts, like I'm just saying you wouldn't like take it by the cup full, right? Cause it's brandy, but um, you can have it in, you know, small little glasses fulls. And there's obviously lots of yummy phytonutrients in there and it's a great way to prepare it. For all of the studies looking at rose hips and inflammation, generally larger dosages were used like by eating the rose hips, um, the powder, et cetera. So um, yeah, there's just kind of different reasons why you would choose one preparation over another, depending on what your purpose is and um, and the results you want, which again is something we spend a lot of time with in cooling inflammation, because I think when you, you know, there's one thing to say like, oh, I want to enjoy herbs and I want to bring them into my life and I want to make yummy beverages from them. I love that. So I'm not poo-pooing that at all. I think as an herbalist, that's one of my greatest joys in life is to bring nourishing foods um, and herbs into my life that I get to enjoy as a part of my life. But if we're going to make claims and say, you know, we want this herb to do something that we can measure, like reducing inflammation, we have to get a lot more specific about dosage, preparation, et cetera. And I just think um, we need to do that, right? Because we can't just say, again, like, oh, like rose hips are wonderful for arthritis. And then, you know, then someone takes a bite of a rose hip and then they're like, why do I still have arthritis? Well, because <laughs> that, you know, there's a, there is a way of working with herbs to really get the results. Um, all right. Uh, Karen has a great suggestion that I talk about the safety of roses again, pertaining to pesticides and florists versus organically grown and wild. So great little prompt there, Karen. Um, so yes, when you're working with roses, it's important to make sure that they don't have, they haven't been sprayed extensively and pretty much all of the roses that you get from commercial florists are going to be heavily sprayed. It's kind of sad that the rose industry, the commercial rose industry is pretty horrible. Um, lots of people who work in that industry come down with cancer. You can just do any sort of search for that. I don't have a study to show you off um, the tip of my tongue, but there's well documented that the people who work within that industry um, really suffer because of all of the horrible things. And this is often like the roses that you get for Valentine's Day. They're grown out of season or they're grown, you know, in a, several countries down south in order to get them to be in bloom during Valentine's Day, which is not often the case in North America. Typically with those roses that come from the florist, you're not going to get rose hips from them. So they're, you know, they're harvested in flower and they're not going to be red. Um, but you definitely want to be suspicious of anything that might have been sprayed. Uh, so looking for organically grown is going to be important. Um, let's see. Let's. What other questions? That um, Saluna Alchemy says, "What do you think about apple cider vinegar as a menstruum for rose hips?" I'm so glad you mentioned that, and I can't believe I haven't done that already because that is one of my favorite ways to prep rose hips. Um, because vinegar is great for pulling out vitamins and minerals. It's one of the, it's what it does best really. And then you, it also creates this really beautiful ruby red um, liquid that you can then um, use for all sorts of things. You could turn it into like a shrub or oxymel by adding some honey to it and then use it as a sipping drink, or you can use it to make your own salad dressings and marin marinades, et cetera. So vinegar is absolutely wonderful for rose hips. Thanks for that um, question. All right, let's see. Uh, Brenda said, what would you use the rose hip seed oil in and would this make you itch? No, so there's no irritating, that's a good question. There's no irritating hairs when you have the oil. It's just, it's very moistening. And it's often used in things like, you know, creams, body butters. You could just use it as a facial oil. Um, it has a lot of benefits in it for helping the skin with elasticity and integrity. 
a specific study showing that it really helps with scar prevention and scar reduction. So it's, it's you know, beloved for topical use. Um, Linda says, I joined classes, but I don't know how. Um, definitely want to help with that. So if you head over to coolinginflammation.com, you'll find all the information for the course. And when you scroll down, you'll see there's a, a place to register. Uh, let's see what other. Um, yeah, so it's Karen just prompted if you asked a question earlier and it's not been answered, please type it in again. So I want to be sure you get all of your questions answered. If you all know me, whether you've taken other classes with me or been on live webinars with me, you know, that's something I'm passionate about because I truly believe that as an herbal teacher, my success is seeing your success. So I'm not here to, um, you know, pretend that um, I'm like withholding information. I want you to get the information you need, information you need. Um, with the cooling inflammation class, that is eight weeks of answering your questions and making sure you get the help you need. And obviously, I cannot share all of the information, all of the information that's being shared in those eight weeks, um, because that just takes time. Uh, but that's definitely something I want to do is make sure you get your questions answered. Uh, Rachel says, I would love to hear about whether infusing rose hips in oil is valid for skin benefit. I honestly don't know. I've never done that. And it doesn't strike me as something that's really, um, uh, like, it doesn't strike me as something that oil is going to be able to extract really well. So I'm just not really sure about that. Uh, I would like for me personally, I stick with the rose hip seed oil, which is something I do use a lot of, but I'm just not sure you could try it and just, you know, get a sense of like, did the oil extract the rose hips? You know, how does, how does it smell? How does it look? But something tells me like my intuition is that is not going to be the best use of that. But um, I don't want you to be limited by my lack of experience. And I would say it's worth trying. Um, is it still possible to watch the webinar, How to Heal Chronic Inflammation with Herbs? Um, I'm going to try and work on getting that sent out tomorrow. Um, so yes, hopefully so. I know some people couldn't make it or they had some buffering issues. So I want to make sure that gets spread widely. Um, all right, seeing some questions not about cooling inflammation and not about rose hips, which I want to just prioritize getting questions answered about those things, because if we open it up to all herbal questions in the world, um, then we'll be here for a long time. So just want to prioritize getting these ones that are just on topic. Um, Jaya says, oh, just responding to someone else, I have bought de-seeded rose hips several times and only been able to use them for teas, still too many seeds or inedible pieces in them to use in foods. That's a bummer. Um, I would um, work on, you know, finding a better source because it shouldn't be like that. When I buy them, there's no seeds and inedible pieces. And now I've just remembered that I have a whole other presentation that I wanted to show you. So we're going to, I'm just going to do that. It's just a couple of minutes. Um, and this presentation, I just, is very short, but I just wanted to come up with this analogy because probably one of the main questions I get about cooling inflammation um, is, Will herbs work for me in my particular problem? Or people even more commonly will say, I have blank disease, XYZ disease. What herbs are going to help me? You just turn off this banner. And so I was thinking about that and I was like, well, that is a great question. And is often what motivates us, right? We have a problem. We want something to help us with it. And we're wondering, can herbs even help? Or more specifically, is there a particular herb that can help? And so my analogy for you is this. Let's say you have a plant and that plant has some kind of disease or infestation. A lot of times when this happens, we think, what can we just spray on that plant, right? How do we spray this plant, get rid of the disease or the inflammation? The problem with that, of just using, like thinking like, okay, what one thing can I do to fix this topical problem that I see is that it often doesn't work or we have to keep, you know, another disease props up. 
on the plant. And so we have to spray it again. We have to keep spraying. And the problem with this is that we're just never getting to the root cause of the problem. So I have something else <laughs> to suggest we try. And that's that we start thinking about it holistically. And as master gardeners will tell you, when you have a plant out in the garden, one of the biggest things that will show whether or not it's going to um, thrive is the complexity of the soil. You know, is the soil rich? Does it have nutrients, et cetera? Also, plants can't exist on their own, right? We know that plants communicate with each other, and we know that the more diversity of plants that are there, the healthier and more robust they're going to be. And that's why monoculture farms struggle so much. And they have to, you know, spray so many poisons on their plants is because they don't have diversity of other plants there. But it doesn't just start, of course, with the other plants or even with the soil. But we know we need so much diversity in the ecosystem. We need pollinators. We need predatory insects. We need things that push the soil and move the soil around. So we need all sorts of beings um, and basically this holistic approach in order to really address the root cause of plant problems. So when people say, you know, what herb is good for blank disease? I think of it, you know, as this, it's like, well, we're just trying to spray the problem away and just trying to find this kind of superficial or band-aid approach for the thing we can see. But so much of our um, chronic health problems today are because of chronic inflammation. And so we have to get to the root. So cooling inflammation course is really thinking about holistic health from the root. How do we actually address chronic inflammation? How do we solve the problem that's causing all of the problems of today, like type 2 diabetes, like arthritis, like asthma, like sleep problems, like fatigue and tiredness, like cancer, like heart disease? We have to get to the root. And so I'm you know, never want to seem like I'm withholding information and in that I'm not going to say, oh, take this herb for that problem. If it were that easy, you, I would be the first person to tell you to do that. But it really is a more complex thing. We're thinking of holistic health. We're thinking of all of these different things, like with a plant would be the soil and the other plants and the pollinators. But we have to build it from, from the ground up, right? Or even below that in the case of a plant, rather than doing a this for that type of thing. And that's what we do in coolinginflammation.com. And that's why it takes two months, right? It's not about just saying, oh, take this herb. It's not about saying, oh, take turmeric and all your problems will go away. Again, if I could say that and that worked, we would do that. <laughs> but it doesn't work like that. It really is this more holistic approach. And so for eight weeks, we create that foundation. We explore it together. We choose something to do each week, an invitation so we can joyfully move through that. Um, something that I'm really opposed to is like doom and gloom. Uh, a lot of alternative health practitioners will use that as some kind of rallying cry to just, you know, make people afraid of toxins, make people afraid of foods, make people afraid and as a way to motivate them. I'm just not into that. I think that the more joyful we can be, the happier and healthier we can be. And so a big part of the course is about joy. It's about prioritizing two months of your life to joyfully welcome in all of these herbs and other practices into your life, which is kind of like it holds this like bookmark for your life, right? I know whenever I take online courses, it's not just about the course, but it's like my life then becomes infused in this thing because it's like I'm just holding the space for this particular topic. So we get to do that for two months, really focus on it. Uh, last year, I had a bunch of moms in the course, and they said that I just heard repeatedly from them that they, by taking the course, they were able to prioritize their own health, set a time, set aside time each week to focus on themselves, and that was a gift in themselves as well. All right, that's the last slide for that. But again, if your cooling inflammation is um, starting on Thursday. So it's enrollment is now and just for a short time. And you can go to coolinginflammation.com to check that out. Um, all right. So Luna says, is cooling inflammation series a beginner, intermediate, or advanced course? I'm interested. Also wondering how deep it will go will be useful for people with herbalism training experience. 
So last year, I was curious about that too. And so I asked that in the survey that I did. And um, I had hundreds of people return that survey. And I had people who were both um, complete beginners with herbs. So they, they got so much out of the course and they thought it was the perfect place to start with herbs. I also had a lot of intermediate her herbalists who said that because it was focused on a specific topic, they learned so much about things that they didn't previously know. So I would say both. I will say though that this course is not about advanced physiology. We don't spend time like looking at the biochemical processes. It's not about memorizing facts. Um, it's really about getting results. So yeah, there's not deep level of physiology and there's not memorizing facts. And so if that's more of like where you're thinking, oh, I really wanna know the complex physiology behind chronic inflammation, um, I want to know lots about chemical constituents and et cetera, then cooling inflammation is probably not for you. Cooling inflammation really is more um, certainly evidence-based, but really we're thinking about things super practically and getting results. Um, let's, I, looks like I'm getting some questions about the rosehip elixir. So there's no like exact way to do this, but how I like to do it is fill, if you're using fresh rose hips, fill a jar with the rose hips, then put some honey in. How much honey you use is up to you and how much of a sweet tooth you have. I probably do like a third of the jar, maybe less, like a quarter of the jar filled with honey. And then you fill the rest of that with brandy. I just like brandy because it tastes good. You could use vodka or cognac or some, some other kind of spirit, but that's what I like to use. And then you want to shake that up a lot for the next week or so, and then strain that off um, in about four to six weeks. You can taste it and see when it's ready. Um, let's see. Another question, how many hips can you eat in a day? Well, I would start with a low amount and then see how your body handles that. Just so, you know, you never want to take on something too, too much, too fast, just to see how it goes. Um, but I don't know of an upper limit there. Um, hi, Kate. Nice to see you here. Uh, I hear a lot about gut inflammation. Does gut affect osteo or, or RA? How much of the course is about gut stuff? Um, because right or wrong, I assume that's not relevant for those with arthritis. So this is actually a great question. There is, There can be a lot of inflammation in the gut, absolutely. The thing about chronic inflammation is that it's so, it's a systemic problem, right? It's pervasive in the entire body. And I do break down the course into different body systems, but it, in some ways that just gives me a way to organize the course materials in a way that makes sense to all of us, but is also a bit of a misnomer because we aren't really separated, right? Um, and what happens with chronic inflammation is that we have, it's not that you just have chronic inflammation in one place and not another. It's that chronic inflammation might be everywhere, but it shows up in one place, right? And so, What's interesting about arthritis in particular, which is something I'm especially passionate about, um, Kate, you might know that I had a type of rheumatoid arthritis that was an autoimmune disease and um, where doctors, they told me that I would only live until I was 40. I just celebrated my 42nd birthday, um, but doctors really didn't have a good prognosis for me. I mean, they said this was kind of the end of my life. Uh, that was about, that was over 20 years ago now. And um, for me, it was actually healing my gut that had a bit, you know, one of the biggest impacts. Another thing about gut health is that we know that most of, so much of our nervous system is in our gut. And so sometimes the inflammation in the gut, we don't really know the inflammations in the gut, but we do experience it as nervous system imbalances. So that was an interesting thing about the class last year is how many people, um, I, you know, I told people show up to every class, even if you think it's not relevant to you. And because we aren't again, chasing a band-aid solution and we aren't chasing this for that, we're looking at things holistically. And every week, so many people said, I didn't think this was going to be relevant to me, but it was. So I'm again, 
just to summarize, <laughs> is that we are all interconnected whole. Chronic inflammation doesn't just show up, you know, in our finger and not show up in our toes, right? It shows up everywhere. And in order to address chronic inflammation, we have to look at it everywhere. So that is, I hope, an answer to your question. Let me know if it's not. And if you want to be more specific, I can help with that too. Um, Saluna, so great questions. Do you think chronic inflammation could show up as part of the underlying root cause for chronic neck tension, tension headaches? It certainly could. Um, it could not too. There could be different variations for that. Uh, we, in the cooling inflammation course, we spend a whole, a whole week on the musculoskeletal system. And I have a lot of solutions for there, for that, which, you know, could be, could be inflammation, but also we look at other things as well. So um, I think chronic inflammation does cause so we know that it does cause so many problems. That is not a question. I'm not going to pretend that it causes all of our problems though. So I would say it could, or it couldn't. Um, Colleen's wondering if the cooling inflammation course is over, only offered once a year and that is correct. And this is, um, most likely the last year I'll be offering it as a live course that'll, um, you know, be using just pre-recording other times, but it is about a once a year thing. Let's see what questions. So again, if you um, have questions that haven't been answered, please let me know. Um, looks like Chris asked, rose hips are good in syrup. What would be another herb to add along with them? Well, one of my favorite inflammation modulating syrups uh, that I like to make is with rose hips, hawthorn, and elderberries. Um, sometimes I switch it up and put hibiscus in that, but those are some that I really love. You could also go a different route. Those are all kind of like tart things that I think complement each other really well. But you could also, with rose hips, you could do cinnamon, um, rose hip cinnamon. That could be yummy. Uh, oh, I like doing a rose hip chocolate syrup. That's great for, you know, like your pancakes and stuff. Um, cacao, also another wonderful way to modulate inflammation. You want to use high quality cacao. You know, you're not talking like Hershey's milk, milk chocolate here. Um, so but the high quality stuff is great. All right, here we have the most in question, important question of the, the whole day. Did you knit the sweater you're wearing? Well, yes, yes, I did. Thank you. I've actually knit six like this. I don't know if you can tell, but there's like a leaf pattern on there. So I keep knitting more and more of them. Um, I do enjoy the knitting. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Kate, Kate knows. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for noticing. I want to have um, this particular pattern in every single color because I don't know, for those of you who watch my YouTube channel, I do try to color coordinate my outfits with the plant I'm talking about. So, um. Great question here. Um, are rose hips okay for diabetics due to the sugar content? Could they drink as a tea if eating whole too much of the sugar content? So rose hips are fabulous for type 2 diabetes. Shown lots of improvements there with both the inflammatory state of um, type 2 diabetes. Uh, so it's not a problem of too much sugar at all. You, if someone had type 2 diabetes, I definitely wouldn't say make a rose hip syrup with lots of honey or sugar and have it that way. You know, I wouldn't do that, but it could certainly be, you know, the powder can be eaten, the, the tea, as you suggest, absolutely. But as a whole, you know, there's it, that's not a concern. It's kind of like, you know, raspberries and blueberries, both fruits that have naturally, um, occurring sugars in them, but both typically are okay for type two, type two diabetes that I would say. So we do spend a whole day, a whole week on the cardiovascular system and looking at type two diabetes. And last year in class, so many people realized that they were actually pre-diabetic. They didn't know that before. And they found that out through the class and was able to stop that process before it um, accelerated into full-blown diabetes. And that is something I'm so super passionate about is that type two diabetes is both preventable and reversible 
um, depending on where the stage is at. And finding that out when there's a pre-diabetic state is so important. So that's, we spend a whole week on that. All right. It seems like questions are kind of slowing down. Again, if I haven't answered your question, let me know. And just to put in my little <laughs> quip again, cooling inflammation workshop, we're going to have so much fun. We had so much fun last year. Um, and I'm just super excited again for this year. It's not just, of course, about having fun, but for me, creating a space that's safe, that's welcoming, there's not shame, there's not judgment. We're there to learn, to be inspired, to invite herbs into our lives, and it can truly make a powerful difference in your life. Uh, you know, being able to stop diabetes and reverse it, being able to wake up in the morning without aches and pains, being able to not have headaches or foggy th thinking, being able to, um, you know, like see your arthritis symptoms disappear. Those are all important things that will serve you the rest of your life. And herbs are such a wonderful way to do that. We just have to know, you know, how to do it. And that's exactly what cooling inflammation is all about. Um, yeah, so without, if we don't have a lot more questions, then I'll, I can let you all go on your way. Now, Michelle says, um, Michelle was the opposite. There was me who found out I had hypoglycemia just from uploading invitations and monographs for the class. Yeah, so um, that's definitely something uh, important to know. And I'm getting lots of thank yous and enjoy and kudos for the class. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And Angel says, when does enrollment end? That's Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. And because class starts on Thursday and there's foundational stuff to get started in the class right away as soon as you join. And yeah, thanks for all of your kind words. Glad that um, you got to spend some time with rose hips. Go out there, taste, um, taste those rose hips. Try them in a variety of ways. And for those of you who feel called to join Cooling Inflammation, I look forward to seeing you, you in the class. We get to hang out like this every week, uh, which is pretty fun, or um, through the recordings. Uh, of course, we have a lot more support materials in the course. We'll be choosing our first week. What we do first day is choosing a plant ally. So I have some suggestions on what plant allies you might choose. And um, then you get to work with that plant for two months and the realizations and health break breakthroughs that people had through that experience last year was really fun too. So um, yeah, and uh, thanks for all the kind words. Thanks again, everyone, for being here today on a Saturday and um, getting to you know nerd out about <laughs> inflammation and rose hips with me. Thanks to Michelle and Karen for being in the background and uh, Karen, for getting all those questions together for me. It's very helpful. I'd love to be able to answer those for you all. So um, thank you all so much again for being here, and I hope you have a beautiful day.